All right, and I think we are now live on YouTube. So hello, YouTube. Hello to all the people who are watching now and in the future. Hello, future. How you doing? Um, my name is uh, Danny, and I think what I need to do here actually is change to make sure my preferences are using dual monitors. I am great. Um, my name is Danny, and uh, oh, I also usually share my screen. We should get that up. Okay. Um, and I am the lead instructor for Actualize Coding Bootcamp, and we are about to show you some presentations of some projects um, that the students who are graduating today are going to be demonstrating. Uh, so one of the absolute best things about my job and what I get to do as a lead instructor at Actualize is I get to work with some really, really uh, motivated individuals who have taken a really a uh, big leap to attempt to transform their career and do something different, in this case, web development. So this leap is something that they've considered. They've come here, they've worked really, really hard, and they have built full stack projects that you are about to see presented. Um, they learned all of the skills of how to build these full stack projects in the last four months, uh, with one month of pre-work and three months of live instruction. And they are going to show you those projects today. They built everything from scratch, their back ends, their front ends. Um, a lot of them are actually using tools in their projects that I did not explicitly teach them. And that's because the number one skill that we teach here at Actualize is to learn how to learn, not to learn any specific skill, but the uh, actual art of learning. That's the thing we taught here. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start by introducing one of our panelists today who's going to be asking our graduates uh, a few questions, um, who also happens to be the Dean of Instruction at Actualize. So I'm going to introduce Peter and let Peter give a little uh, intro about himself um, so that when we see him panel later, we'll know who he is. So Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Peter Jang. As Danny mentioned, I'm the Dean of Instruction at Actualize. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, coding since 1998, so uh, for a very long time, professionally for about 10 years. And uh, I actually went through a coding boot camp maybe six or seven years ago um, just to learn web development. So I actually understand um, all the hard work that it takes to, to build these final projects. Um, and, and so what you guys are about to see is, is it's going to be the culmination of all of that work. And so it's, it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that everybody's put into it for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've also been teaching at Actualize for the about five years now. So I've uh, led many uh, students through the same process. Um, and yeah, so I just want to say uh, in advance, I'm really excited to, to looking forward to see all of the hard work that you put into it and the, the projects that you have. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. And I also want to throw a couple of shout outs before we begin today to all of the people who helped to make the experience possible. Um, of course, Jay Wengro, our CEO, uh, made actualize so made this super possible um, we also have our career advisors lisa and sarah we appreciate you guys and everything that you do for the students and i also have my wonderful tas i've got david mckenzie and winston who have helped these students and who have put in their own blood sweat and tears to help those uh, the students build the projects that you're about to see so thank thank you everybody who is involved in making this happen and without further ado i'm going to throw it on over to our first student presenter, or should I say grad presenter, we're gonna have to do the ceremony where we, you know, bring our things over to the other side. Um, and I'm gonna throw it on over to Will. So Will, you can go ahead and share your screen and show us what you've built. Get everything oriented here. Good deal. All right, hello, my name is Will Petty. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, the app that I built is called ResX, and it is an app centered around hunting and fishing uh, leases and guide services. Uh, kind of came to fruition based on a conversation that I was having with a friend of mine about um, about the lack of a social media site other than Facebook and large groups that uh, that that really gave you the ability to center and to focus on hunting and fishing and being from the south and being really immersed in that culture. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to maybe give this a shot and uh, try to try to build just sort of a prototype of what that would look like. So 
I'm going to take you through uh, the just sort of the general movement of that and kind of what we did with or what I did with this particular application. Um, so here, this is sort of your landing page. Um, we've got a spot where I'm going to log myself in as my own personal user here. Oh, can't type. And that takes you to the listings index page, which is just the general overview. It provides you uh, an image, uh, your, your title, and then just a truncated version of the description that we'll get into here in a little bit. Uh, this is the address that would be listed on that particular listing. So here you can see this is the owning user uh, that has posted that listing on the site. Uh, I have given a handful of guys here the ability to host. So let's take you into the listing show page. Um, so uh, at the top, obviously, everybody, all they care about is images. So uh, we put the images at the top and we have a modal here that pops up where you can get into a little bit more detail. Um, and then, you know, just sort of uh, be a place where you could just put some some shots of your land or your, your lease or particular hunts that you've had. Sort of the general details are over here to the right, available dates remaining, uh, the address for it, uh, it states right here that there's a map below. Here you've got a form where you can email the host directly from the site, from the page. So this doesn't pop up with an email, you know, for from your Gmail account or whatever client that you use. Um, this just sends it straight from the page, uh, makes it a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to work with. Um, so here you get down into more of the details of the lease itself or the guide service or whatever it is that you're after. Um, so you've got your listing available. There's your title. Here's a more detailed description of what's going on. Um, and then you've got a couple of links here that we'll get into in just a second. And my personal favorite, uh, this part of the app is uh, what I enjoy the most because if any of y'all are hunters or fishermen, that you you definitely enjoy looking at maps. So we've got an interactive map. You click on the, the little pin there and it gives you your address. And then here you can kind of look around and you can see, all right, we're, you know, I see we've got a lake here that we can fish on. I see we've got a bunch of land that's kind of over here to the side that looks like it might be uh, pretty fruitful as far as you know whatever you're trying to do hunt fish or whatever it is so you can do that um, you can click over to the streets view here and it will populate sort of your standard kind of uh, google or apple maps what you're looking at when you're driving in the car um, and you can you could kind of find where you are you can see you know i live in memphis so we could scroll out see memphis there kind of see that we're really just not that far away so it'd be a good spot for us to go so from there, I'm going to take you where you can edit a listing. Um, so here you just fill out all your basic information. We've got an array of images down here. You can, well, that's wrong. That's not what I was looking for, but you can sit here and delete this image. So you can take it and do that. I do not have a, let's see if we can get this. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that guys. Add that image back in so you can see it populates up right there. Um, we're going to go back from there. I'm going to take you to the uh, user show page. So this is my personal page here. Um, you can see you've got a chance to edit your info. You've got a new listing spot right there where you can go in to create a listing. Your listings are available here. Um, it shows that you are a confirmed host. Uh, we'll get into the differences in uh, the differences in users here in a second. All of your listings are available, it gives your city. This would be a good spot for just some uh, social media websites or anything that you had that you wanted to list. Um, and in good faith to the social media community, I left two slides here, or two cards for advertisements because that's uh, where everybody makes their money. Um, so from there, I'm going to take you to another user over here and get to his profile. As you can see, uh, Stuart is not a host, so it, list there that he's not you don't have the option to see the listings but what you do have that is similar that uh, is another one of my favorites in this particular application is you have the ability to send and receive messages so here uh, i have a conversation that has been struck up i'm going to go ahead and pull that up on that and go back i have a conversation that's been struck up between myself and Stuart, and so we have a short little combo going here about maybe finding a place to fish so I'm going to shoot uh, from his particular, from his uh, 
account, I'm going to send back a message and say, all right, we'll make that work. I will send that over and we can see that that populates in with my messages on my user page. So um, some things that I would like to do sort of in the future, I used uh, Rails for the back end and Vue.js for the front. Um, my mapping API is Mapbox and then, um, yeah, so some things that I would like to do in the future is I would like to bring a better social aspect to it. I would uh, like to create sort of an index of users that we can um, go through, search for them, and then from there really take it to the social aspect of being able to create groups for those particular users. And uh, hopefully that can be done here pretty soon uh, to make it more of a land management app as well as a social media and advertisement app. So that is ResX, and I appreciate everybody listening in. Awesome. Thanks so much, Will. So I'm going to throw it over to Peter to ask a question or two uh, about your project. All right. Yeah, that's a, a really awesome app, William. Uh, I just have to say, uh, I know what it takes to build a social media app. So the back end can be quite hairy when you're doing, you know, friends and messages and things like that. But at the same time, your front end is really sharp. Like, uh, it's really, you know, simple and plain, but like the, the attention to detail that you have here uh, on all the different pages and making sure everything, you know, stays within um, uh, the, 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 the boundaries, like it's really difficult. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of students to, to try and get some of that stuff in the margins and the padding. So uh, first of all, I'm just curious, where do you feel like you spent most of the time working on in terms of like back end, front end and, and balancing those two different things? Um, so I definitely spent a lot of time in the back end particularly on the messages side of things. Sure. Um, so associating messages to conversations is something that took uh, a pretty fair amount of my time. The, the general construction of the app was just basic crud. And then once you kind of get outside of that, um, outside of that, that little box and move into the messaging side of things, that was where on the back side, on the back end of the, of the application, that's what really took up the majority of that time. Um, on the front end, it was just kind of, uh, I mean, everybody knows how CSS is. Um, so just getting everything to, to fit and really look and look clean. Um, so making sure that you didn't have any kind of weird stray lines or, or, or have a footer down here that didn't have any content in it. Or, you know, it's just uh, being being the way that that, that CSS is. It, it can be it can be a little bit it can be a little hairy. So. That was the general. That was the general problem with the front end side of things. Is just is, is having to spend all that time and be really meticulous about about what you did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, going back to the messages, uh, what did you use to get the the message to show up uh, immediately from one one browser to the other? Uh, so we used a messages channel on the back side, on the back end through Rails, and then um, associated each message with a conversation. So if you click into the messages show pay or the messages index page, it doesn't really populate anything immediately, but then you can go through to a particular message channel um, as you click into that and move from one to another, it will populate each based on the, uh, the messages channel that we have on the back end. Yeah, very cool. It's, a, it's obviously a very useful feature to have. Um, the email section, was that actually sending emails or was that just a placeholder for people to be able to send emails? Um, are you talking about in the profile here? Uh, I think in the- Or uh, on the listing the show. The listing show page. Okay, so this is a form that I built and that will send an email directly to the host of this particular, of this particular listing. Um, Got it. So you don't have to- this is the email of the user that is actually looking in and wanting more information about the listing. Got now, it, got on it. this side of things, if you go to the profile, which um, here and you click into email a user, that will populate a page from whatever email client that you use. So you can get a little bit more detailed about the email. You can send, you can set your own subject and things of that nature. The form that's on the listing show page will just send the, the subject line will populate with just uh, I am interested in, and then it provides the address of the listing that you're, that you're looking at. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess one last question, uh, just in terms of both the back end and front end, like I said, this app has a lot of complexity on both sides. Uh, which did you enjoy working in more? 
I definitely enjoy the back uh, the back end of things than more than the front. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I like, like uh, I'm, data collection more than I like uh, more than I like styling. I'm, I'm not very. <laughs> I'm naturally not not a super uh, not a super artistic guy. So uh, so that that is something that doesn't come naturally to me. So, but I definitely enjoy the data side, the data collection side of things. But it you know it it, it became more comfortable the more I worked with it uh, to to work through CSS and, and, and figure out kind of how it applies and, and wrap wrapper divs and things like that, uh, that, you know, maybe you're not so used to when you've been working in rails and, and such for several weeks or months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I gotta say for somebody who prefers the back end more than the front end, uh, you, you really have a very sharp looking app on the front end. So, uh, congrats for, for, for all the hard work you put into it. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Uh, thanks for opening it up. That's not always the easiest job to do. You killed it, which I knew you would, obviously. And I'm going to throw it on over to our very next presenter, uh, who's going to be Katie. So Katie, go ahead, take it away for us. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie. I'm from uh, Vista, California, just north of San Diego. Um, I'm going to be presenting my app called Movie Drop. It's an application where users can friend each other and send each other movie recommendations. Uh, it kind of stemmed out of an idea where I can never remember what movies my friends recommend for me. Um, and then on top of that, if I do actually remember the movie, I can never remember who sent it. So this is kind of just a way to streamline that process rather than trying to just keep it in your head. So when a user first comes onto the page, they will see this here, they're able to either sign up for an account or, or log in. And I have an account already, so we'll go ahead and log in. When a user first logs in, they are directed to their profile page. Um, here, they're able to do basic actions, edit their profile or delete it. You can also see your own movie suggestions and who sent them, uh, as well as your friends list down here. So um, for editing a user, users are able to add their own phone numbers. This is primarily to receive uh, notifications um, through Twilio, which I will demonstrate in just a little bit. Um, you can also upload your own profile picture, and this I uh, implemented with the Cloud and Area API. So we'll go ahead and demonstrate that for you now. And when it works, you get a flash message up at the top. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So for friends, um, we're able to manage our friends list. So this is our friends index page here. We can do our basic action actions, unfriending. Down here, we see our pending friendships. So I can either approve a request that was sent to me or just delete a request outright if I have it pending with someone else. Um, if I want to view one of my friend's pages, I can click there and see their profile page. On their profile pages, I can see their uh, movie suggestions. This is primarily so you don't accidentally somewhat send someone a duplicate movie, so I can just double check it's not on their list already. Uh, if I wanted to add a new friend, I can go to the user's index page and I can search for a user by their username. So uh, if my friend Silas sent me his username, I can search for him here, go to his profile, and then add him as a friend. And if you see, I can't see his movie recommendations. That's something that's only privileged to friends. Uh, if we go to my suggestions page here, this is where I can manage all of my suggestions. Um, I can see whether or not I've watched it. Um, if it's if I have seen it, you'll see this icon here. If I haven't, you'll see this one. I can also sort my movies by sender. Um, you can see here it's in alphabetical order and whether or not I've watched it. So my unwatched movies will pop at the top and my watched movies will pop down here at the bottom. Um, if I want to send a movie request to my friend, we'll go to this movies index page here. On the side, we have a list of articles. This was implemented with the news API. Um, this is just to give users an idea of what movies may be coming out, what's available on certain streaming services. Uh, if I click on any of these, it will take me to an external link where I can read that article and get some more information. So if I want to send a movie to a friend, um, I can look for that movie by title. So I'm looking for a movie with the word seven in it. And it will populate a list of movies that have the word seven in it. At this point, um, it will return you 10 movies with that uh, keyword in it. Um, let's see. I think we'll send this movie. So this information is coming from the OMDB API. Um, it's an external API here. So here, when we get on the show page, we'll see the poster, a short synopsis, uh, readings from IMDB. 
as well as uh, some basic information here. Now, if I want to send this to a friend, I'm going to click on the suggest to friend button. And I'm going to look for a friend here. I want to send it to my friend Carolyn Thompson. Um, now, Carolyn Thompson has it set up on her profile that she can receive notifications with her phone number. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate that for you right now. Danny was nice enough to lend her phone number for my presentation. So let's send this here. And Danny, can you confirm that you received a notification? Look at that. Oh, yeah, it happened. Awesome. Cool. And then you also get this notification here that it was sent successfully. If you want to get, uh, you can also see a movie clip from the movie. This was implemented with a node package called Movie Trailer, and it pings YouTube for you and finds you a link, uh, finds you a video related to the movie. Typically, it's a trailer. Sometimes it's behind the scenes um, or just a short clip from the movie. And you can watch that here without going to YouTube. You can also expand it to full screen if you'd like. And if you want to get this information, um, you can also go to your suggestions page and click on any of these movies and get the information that you'd like to see from there as well. So that is Movie Drop. Um, yeah, so uh, in the future for version two, if I'd like to add anything else, um, on the movies uh, index page, when I search for a movie, I'd like to implement it so that it returns more movies for you. Um, and in that sense, I'd like to add pagination so that um, you can just keep going through more movie suggestions and not have to be restricted to a certain list. Um, I'd also like to set it up so you can recommend shows as well, because I know uh, there's a lot of shows coming out, especially with COVID. Everyone's got all kinds of stuff on their lists. So it'd be really nice to manage your shows as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's Movie Drop. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, and I cannot believe you stuffed that much feature content into this presentation. So I'm going to throw it over to Peter to ask a few questions. Yeah. Uh, first of all, awesome job, Katie. And I was actually going to echo the exact same thing from my count. It's Cloudinary, Twilio, News API, OMD, Movie Trailer. That is a lot of different external services. And you really did a great job pulling it all together into a single app. Um, out of those different external services, which one did you feel like was the most challenging or the most interesting to work with? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I really enjoyed working with all of them. It was really fun doing the research and trying to figure out like which ones would work for my for my particular app. Um, probably my favorite one to work with was actually Twilio because it was just really exciting to get the notifications to ping on my phone. And um, once it started working, I was like, oh my gosh, it's working. Um, but then uh, probably the most difficult was actually Cloud and Airy, trying to figure out all the little technical aspects of it. Um, and I had set it up uh, through my Cloudinary account that it would actually crop your photos for you so it doesn't mess with the layout of the rest of the app. So that was a little bit of a process, but um, it was really rewarding to get it to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a really well-featured app. Um, if you had more time, you said you wanted to integrate other things. Uh, have you looked into integrating with uh, streaming services? I think like, I assume a lot of people have like, you know, their favorite watch lists in their Amazon and it feels very splinted and it seems like a really great way of centering a lot of that content. Um, so is that something that you would want to take uh, as a possible direction for something like this? Uh, yeah, potentially. It was something I had thought about, um, you know, putting lists on here of what movies were available on certain streaming services. So you could actually keep track of that as well. Um, particular API I was working with doesn't host that information. So something sure. in the future, version two, three, four, um, definitely, yes, I would like to integrate it with that. Uh, with those streaming services. Yeah, yeah. I imagine that it's, it's going to be difficult no matter what, because a lot of those services have a lot of walled off content and they don't really want to share that information as well. So this is just yeah. a great app, I think, just just in terms of being able to, you know, put all of that into, into a single place to share with your friends. So yeah, I just wanted to say congrats. This is, this is amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And just a small anecdote, when I was working with Katie or when Katie was working uh, on her own, Katie would continue to come to me and be like, yeah, I got that feature done. Um, what, what should I be building next? And every like couple of hours, Katie would just come back to me and be like, yeah, I'm finished that feature too. And I was like, oh my goodness, I do not know how to keep up with Katie and her ability to implement things so quickly. So really want to give Katie so many props for being able to tinker, figure things out, parse documentation. You really, really were a rock star here. So well done to you. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to throw our uh, presentations over to my next presenter, who is Rob. All right. And don't forget to unmute yourself, Rob, as well. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry for that little uh, bad start, but here we go. Um, so I'm my name is Rob. I'm presenting an app called House Show, which uh, is inspired by seeing and hearing about bands who are uh, sleeping on hotel floors, sleeping on floors of other people's houses, living out of gross vans, uh, asking people who are attending their shows if they have a place to stay and just kind of living a gross pirate lifestyle. So what House Show does is it allows bands to post their tour dates and then have other users message them and say, hey, I have an open place to stay. Come on here, don't sleep on that floor. Um, or sleep on my floor. If it's a floor, it'll just be a nicer floor. Uh, so I'll run you through it. Uh, this is the homepage here. Uh, it has a sign up and a login. Uh, the sign up page is a pretty standard sign up page. It uses Cloudinary for profile uh, picture uploading. It has all the basic information. If you're a band, you leave that checked. If you are not, it populates a couple other additional fields to tell them about the place you're offering to stay. I'm going to log in with an already existing user so we can see what that looks like. So here we have our user page. We have name, bio, profile picture, and then the description of the housing and photos of the housing that they offer. Uh, you can edit your profile page from here. This is a standard edit profile, uh, just changes all the information, includes Cloudinary, also has an option to delete the profile. The housing description here has different photos that you can add a photo, which uses Cloudinary as well to add an image. Um, and the little trash can here will delete an image. So that is the, the main regular user uh, profile page. If you click on the shows tab here, it populates a list of shows that are sorted by both, or they're sorted by date, only using only future dates, and they only show uh, dates that are within 50 miles of the user's address. Uh, and I used Geocoder to do that. So that way someone who's in Virginia doesn't message someone who is playing in Maryland three hours away, because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the particular bands will link to the band's user page, which I have a band logged in here, so you can see that different setup. Uh, top half is the same. The bottom half here has the tour dates. Uh, if you are logged in as a band, you can edit and delete the tours. Uh, so if you wanted to edit a show, you click that, pops up in a modal, you can change anything you want about it. Um, or if you want to delete the, the show, say it gets canceled or if you found a place, you can just delete it and it pops off there. And then adding a show brings you to another page which has the information to add a show there. So back at our normal user, uh, if I wanted to let my friend Kels here stay at my place, I could click message. Rob, Wait, I, uh, I'm going to pause you for a second because I think your screen might be frozen. It's like we can see and hear no. you, but I think your screen share might be frozen here. Should I like restart it or? Let's, yeah, let's have you try resharing the screen. We can maybe try turning it off and on one more time. See if that'll solve it. And. Give it just a moment. Looks like it doesn't want to load properly. Happens every now and again with Zoom, right? And then yeah, it takes like a minute this. or something. Yeah, I'm gonna, let me see if I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my screen share up here and we'll see. Sure. I'm having a similar issue. Okay. 
And I think that we can see this, the shared screen here, maybe, or is it still black for you guys? Okay. All right, Rob, we'll have to try one more time to share your screen. We'll see if that will fix the problem. Yeah, I've seen this happen with Zoom before. Oh, there it goes. I can see your screen. Cool. So we're all good now? Yes, sure. I will let you jump right Perfect. back in. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so did that, I'm assuming you stopped me kind of like right where it started going wrong, or is there anything that you uh, need? Maybe backtrack like a, a few paces, yeah. So I think we were at the band page adding a show. So if you add a show here, um, it's all the same same information that you would need for a show. You can click add a show and it'll populate back in your profile here. So back at the normal user page where they're seeing the list of dates that are near them, if they wanted to offer a band a show, like I have a friend, Kels, who leads this band here. I wanna let her know she can stay with me. I can click this message. If the message already, if a conversation already exists, it will route to the currently existing conversation as it does here. If not, it will create a whole new conversation. Um, and if you just wanted to look at your messages that you have with every band or every user, if you are a band, this messages tab here brings up all your conversations. They're sorted by the last sent message date. So the newest are on top. And if the user is the last person to send a message, it tells them you here, just so you know, like, oh, that message I sent, I don't need to, to look at it. Um, we're gonna jump in here. I did use uh, WebSockets to have the messaging app uh, function live, like a live chat. So just so you can see that here. Um, and it works both ways here. Um, so yeah, that is essentially the function of the entirety of the app. Uh, there are a few things I would like to add in the future, um, both functionally and just other things. Functionality, I really want to put a system that alerts new messages. So like it would put a little, either highlight this or add a little thing there that says like new messages. So, you know, you have a message to check. Um, I'd like to improve the visuals and few certain places. And I'd like to add other ways for bands to kind of offer other services that they might have, uh, whether it's like a virtual lesson or, hey, our bassist does like design on the side if you need us to like design something just so they can like generate a little bit more income for them, help them because they are truly, truly starving artists. Uh, there were a few uh, interesting difficulties I ran into while building this that I thought were fun to sort out. Uh, one of them was uh, sorting the conversations by last message on my messages page. I was trying a million different things on the front end and doing all this crazy logic that wasn't working. And I just added an object on my back end that worked really, really well and made the, the sorting of it on my front end really, really easy. The date sorting and location filtering were, were a task, um, but using moment.js and the geocoder gem, I was able to do that. Um, and the biggest thing was redirecting conversations to an already existing conversation. I was like dreading it the whole time doing it. I did, I was like, I'm not gonna be able to figure this out. And it's, um, I have a piece of code here that I was just proud of that I had to go literally step by step by step by step by step to build this whole thing out um, to find, you know, essentially it finds a user a key value pairing and then routes it to the correct thing um, and then creates a new one. I'm sure there's a million more elegant ways to do it, but I, did that from scratch, just so piece by piece. I used decomposition, um, which was a really good skill. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening to my presentation. Um, and I'd love to hear any questions if you have them. Awesome, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm gonna toss it on over to Peter now. Yeah, I uh, just wanna say a great job, Rob. Uh, I don't know if people know this and maybe Rob, you knew this, but like Airbnb, I think that's the original idea they started off with was like artists coming over and sharing ideas and it sort of sprawled into this whole other thing, really? which came really generic. And so this is really awesome to see, like bringing it back to sort of um, a, like a more specific type of uh, audience and, 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 and having sort of that uh, ethos of, of sharing and sharing, you know, uh, culture and music, all that kind of stuff is really cool to see. Um, so you mentioned, you know, this, this uh, logic that you have over here 
here uh, on your front end, as well as like geocoding and address checking, which I assume is happening on the back end. Uh, yeah. Did you find it more difficult to, to put, you know, logic on the front end or the back end, which did you enjoy working with more? Um, I, I don't know. I kind of like, I always say I have like a, like a front end heart and a back end brain. Um, <laughs> like I really, really want to like do like front end and like make stuff like visually exciting for the user and have it like work for a user but like my brain works in that very logical like backend way um so i don't know if i have a preference but like seeing how they came together especially with like the the, the message sorting i was like dead set on this has to be done on the front end this has to be done on the front end it has to sort on the front end and just being like oh if i add this one thing in the back end they like work together and it's great. So it was a, a couple of those uh, things that I did were really cool to see like, oh yeah, the back end and the front end work together and remind myself that that's how it works. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So you're basically accusing me of presenting you a false dichotomy. You're like, it's all the same, it's all one. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're vastly different. I just really, really yeah. enjoy the connection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so out of the different things, you mentioned a lot of, you know, complexity. There's a lot of hidden complexity in app like this. Um, which feature did you feel was like a pleasant surprise to implement just in terms of having fun with or you really enjoyed how it came out? Uh, the messaging was really exciting. Um, it, especially once I used the WebSocket to, to have them like populate live and see how it goes. That's kind of when I felt that like my app turned in from like, oh, this is just this idea that I'm building to like, oh, this is like something that functions and works really, really well. Um, so yeah, I think that was that was the most exciting portion for me to implement. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an awesome feature. Yeah, just wanna say congrats again. This is an awesome app. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Rob. Shout out to your bow tie. And we are gonna throw it on over to our very next presenter, who's going to be Shannon. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Shannon and I'm going to be presenting my application, which is um, my personal bookshelf. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give you a quick background. Um, I'm a very avid reader, I love reading, and I really wanted to build an application where users can search for books and add them to their current bookshelf, as well as give them a comment or a review of the book that they read. So I can go ahead and quickly uh, log in with an existing user. And I have a user here, Frodo. And after he logs in, it pushes him to the home page. And from here, there's different uh, tabs on the navigation bar that allows him to search for a book. Um, he can go to his profile or he can go ahead and look at his bookshelf. So I'm gonna go ahead and start by searching for a book. And on the, <clears throat> excuse me, and on the book index page, you can search by either the title or the author of the book, or you can search by the genre. So we can go ahead and start by searching for the title of a book. And I like this book a lot. <laughs> I use this a lot during my testing and it's the book, Alice. So on this page, there's a list of books that populate all with the name Alice in the title. And it populates with a small image, uh, the word uh, Alice, the author, as well as a quick blurb. And this is using the Google Books API. So I can add this book to my bookshelf from the books index page, or I can click to see more information. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And this does pull the book, uh, book ID from the Google Books API, and it is the image of the book cover, the title, the author, the category, how many pages it is, the publishing company, and how many people read this book and what they rated it on uh, Google Books. And from here, if this looks good, I can go ahead and add this to my bookshelf. So I'm gonna say, yes, I wanna read Alice. I'm gonna add this to my bookshelf and it takes a second to load because it is pulling from the Google Books API. So here are all of the books that's on my page. I can go down and I can say, here's the book that I just added to my bookshelf. I can click this checkbox that says I have read it. 
and I can write a review and I can say something like, I absolutely love this book. And I can save this book. And I can go ahead and I can search for another book now via the genre. So I can go ahead and say, I'm going to search for an autobiography now. And all of the books that populate are all of the different autobiographies that's being pulled by the genre. So I can go ahead and say, hey, this looks really good. And I can see more information. And this will pull up the specific book page. Um, let's say that this also <laughs> looks really good. Um, I want to read two books today. I'm going to add this to my bookshelf. And it takes a second to load again. And I can scroll down here and I say, hey, I don't want to read this anymore. I changed my mind. I'm going to go ahead and just delete this book. And then it pushes me to the book's index page with the flash message that says the book has been deleted. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss this. And I can also click on this link to go to my profile. Uh, so this is my current profile with an about me and what I'm currently reading. Um, I can update my account information and I can say that I'm currently reading and I have tons here. So I'll say I'm reading nothing. <laughs> and I can update my account from here and it populates here. And there is a link that takes me to my bookshelf. Um, so one of the features that I really want to add uh, to my bookshelf page is actually the ability to uh, see the books and sort of for an aesthetic reason, but also for I think um, it's a little bit more intuitive to the user. I want the books to show up as cards for it to look more like a digital bookshelf rather than a list of books that they have to scroll through. And another feature that I would like to implement as well as the is the ability for users to go to other user profiles and the ability for them to look at their bookshelf. So up here you can see that this is user 12, but I would like this to be able to um, I would like users to be able to change this to be able to visit their friends profiles and see what they're currently reading. All right. Uh, thank you, Shannon. And I will toss, uh, I'll toss it over to Peter for a couple of questions now. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say this is a, a great app, uh, very practical, something that I think uh, at some point in time, I think I wanted to build something like this, but I never got around to it. So very cool to see it in action. Um, you said you use the Google Books API to pull the data for, for all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what was like working with that API and its documentation? <laughs> It actually was really bad, I'll be honest. Uh, the Google Books API, I think, is really buggy, and it wasn't, it wasn't my first choice. I really wanted to use the Penguin House Publishing API, uh, but when I first signed up for the API key, I didn't receive it. I think I waited about three days. And I didn't want that to be, uh, I didn't want that to hold back my project. So I decided to use the Google Books API. Um, but I can give you a quick example as to why it's a little buggy. So if I search for the author, Cassandra Clare, and these are all her books that populate. If I go down to this book, for instance, Ghosts of the Shadow Market, and I see more information, you can see that it actually populates a different book. And the Google Books ID sometimes relates to a different book entirely. So when I was building out my application, it actually was a little buggy for me. And when I was um, adding books to my bookshelf, um, it wasn't adding the right book. So that was extremely confusing on my end. So if I were to build another version, I think I would use a different API. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah, and the reason I've asked this, I've, I've messed around with the Google Books API and I can know it can be complex, especially pulling the images and getting the data from it and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's very impressive that you have that working uh, fluently in, in the app. Um, cool. Uh, other than working with the Google Books API, I know you said you mentioned you wanted uh, to add a little bit more social media uh, kind of like aspects to where you can see other users and things like that. Can you expound on that a little bit more, like yeah. being able to see other people's bookshelves and then what would you want to be able to do from there? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that was really the idea behind having an about me and what I'm currently reading. Um, I really want users to be able to see what other people's bookshelves are and to be able to uh, see their profiles. Because uh, right now it's just me as Frodo looking at my own about me and what I'm currently reading. And that just seems very lonely. So um, that's something I do want to implement. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, you have a, a rating system in there. So I think it'd be super cool to be able to like look at other people's favorite books and then you can actually use that information to sort of like, you know, make it into a book recommendation engine a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great as it is. Like uh, it's, it's a really cool way. Uh, I know that definitely when I'm watching movies or reading books, it's like I never remember the things to even recommend to other people. So having this information just for yourself is an awesome place to, to begin. So yeah, just wanted to say great job. Very practical app. Very cool. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shannon. And yeah, um, I really enjoyed working with Shannon and getting some of these things uh, up and running with her, but she was very much a, a solo worker, was able to figure out how to utilize that API pretty much all on her own. So um, massive credit to you for what you've built. And uh, I think this is very aesthetically pleasing. It calms me. Um, I'm going to throw it on over to our next presenter, Andrew. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Fillmore. I live in Chicago. Um, introducing you to my app. It's called One Easy Plate. Um, this is an application that uh, the idea I had is a collaboration with my sister Amy, who is a dietitian and educator at the University of Utah. She works in a clinic with people who have diabetes, uh, pre diabetics, and um, heart disease. One of the things she wants to be able to show her clients is a really simple um, tool application to get them to thinking about building health, healthy and sort of well-balanced meals. Um, and so that's sort of the, the genesis of this. Um, I'm gonna log in and I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean. So let me go here. I'll log you in, Peter. Um, so we log in, we immediately come to this find recipes page. Um, the idea behind this is to have um, for each sort of meal to have um, a protein, a vegetable, and a carbohydrate. And that when we put these in, um, we will have returned a um, list of recipes below. I have a parameter set to 10 recipes that are returned. Um, that can change depending on um, sort of user experience. So we can look through these. Um, this one looks pretty good, ginger, beef, and broccoli. I'm gonna click on that and that's gonna take us to the recipe page where we have um, a prep time, servings, I'm just gonna show you ingredients. Um, right here is a little summary of what the recipe is about, even has you know, cost per serving, and then directions here. Um, if you decide to make this recipe and enjoy it, you can leave some comments below. So great recipe, make double next time. I'm gonna save this recipes, which will save it to my favorites up here. This takes a little while to load because it's pulling from a third party API, which I'll talk about in just a second here. Um, hopefully it will load, there we go. So here's some recipes that I've already saved. Um, a feature that I put in is um, being able to, hopefully this will be populated by, you know, dozens of recipes over time. So I want to search for a recipe that I made a couple of weeks ago. It was a vegan black rice tofu. Here it is. So I can come to this recipe and again, we'll see the recipe show page here and go back to my favorites. Um, a little slow here. <laughs> Hopefully it will load. I just want to show you that um, you can, maybe not, there we go. Um, you have the ability to come in here. The comments are under, 
are stored on the favorites page. We can delete recipes if we no longer like them or don't need them around in our recipes box anymore. Um, so that is um, sort of the nuts and bolts of it. I um, One of the things I really enjoyed about this was working with a third party API. I used uh, an API called Spoonacular. Um, I thought it was a really interesting experience being able to like figure out how to send very specific parameters through my back end um, from the front end to this API and then have returned like, you know, hopefully specific information because I'm, I'm, I'm actually very, very excited about this um, launching onto the web. I want this, um, I, I want this app out there. And my sister is really excited about being able to show this to her um, clients. So I think because um, Spinacular is not giving me the sort of exact sort of germane data that I need, I, I'd like to sort of build a version of this with my own database where I would sort of see the data myself with um, really sort of healthy, simple recipes so that I know exactly what a user is going to get returned. Um, and that way I have control over, you know, things like images as well, which is really important for me. I think it's <laughs> some of the recipes that I've stored in here, these all look fairly okay, but some of them are not great. I don't really know where a lot of the data is coming from, from Spinacular. So to just be able to have full control over that is something that I'm, I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a fabulous experience. I, I um, come from sort of a visual arts background. So I was really intimidated in, in building this out on the back end, but I ended up really enjoying the work on the back end. And also um, trying to figure out from the very beginning how, uh, how the user would experience this data and, and, and like sort of planning that from the very beginning, I think was really meaningful and, and interesting um, experience. So that's, that's the app. Awesome, thank you, Andrew. And I'm gonna throw it on over to Peter for a couple of questions. Yeah, first of all, uh, really, really great app. I noticed that you logged in as me, so I don't know if that was kind of like a, a dig. It's a, just to imply that I need to eat a little bit healthier because <laughs> those favorites did not look like a lot of the things that I was eating. So like, I take it, I'll take the hint and uh, I'll, I'll try to be more conscious going forward. Um, yeah, so you mentioned the uh, Spoonacular API. Um, and you mentioned some of the limitations being some images and things like that. So I'm just curious if you can dig into that a little bit more. Did you find it difficult to work with just the structure of the API? Had you explored some other recipe APIs? Would you want to maybe incorporate an app where it's pulling from your own database plus a combination of different recipe APIs? Or what do you think that would look like going forward? Um, one of the things that was difficult is just being very specific. And I think the, the idea for this app, this isn't, this is not Martha Stewart living. This is not Epicurious. This is like really, this is meant to be a tool. And so um, to, to be able to return like very specific data that's germane to this type of website is really important for me. I do want this to live in the world. Like I, I'm fully building this out. So um, I'm, I'm a cook, I've been eating, I've been, I've worked in restaurants, I've been cooking for years. I, I sort of know like what I want, what kind of data I want to seed into the database. And I also am a photographer, I've shot food photography and worked with stylists. So I'm, I'm more than happy to like, you know, get that up and going. Um, working with Spoonacular, it just, it, it just was not getting, getting me the type of like very specific healthy data that I wanted. Got it. Got it. So you're kind of interested in having uh, a more specific uh, type of a, a niche with, with, with the data that you're looking at. So yeah. in that, yeah. So in that vein, would you consider um, if you're seeding your own database, uh, would you consider, I mean, you mentioned that you want this to go live and, and actually start people using it. Would you consider making it like your own API and, and have like users contribute their own potential data to that database and people can, you know, as an admin, you can approve recipes or maybe you can have people upvote and download that kind of stuff. And that way you, you become spoonacular. I don't know. Yes. Like, would would yes. you consider building uh, things out like that? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I've just started 
thinking about that and like yeah. the, the idea that I started thinking about that really is a testament to like this um class like I had never even thought that that was possible but yeah I mean the entire time I'm sitting here thinking like why don't I just build my own API uh, you know and and I think um it's it's an exciting prospect for sure um I also you know because this is a very specific type of website, I, I want to include more comment, like, you know, tips on how to steam broccoli and how to cook pasta and very simple things that we all sort of take for granted. But um, according to my sister, you know, like, it's not just commonly known. And um, it, it can be a barrier to people eating healthy food. So um, there's, there are definitely other components about it about this website that I like, I like to add on, but at the same time, it's just really important that we keep it very simple and user friendly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome. I think the idea of just taking something really broad, which is like, everybody's got recipes, everybody's got recipe sites, but to, to specify to a specific audience and really kind of hone your data in on that and hone your user experience on that is, I think is a, is really amazing. It's a very powerful yeah. uh, way of like, you know, improving an idea by reduction and simplification, as opposed to just doing more and more with it. So that's awesome. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's an awesome app. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I, this conversation was like mind opening. I loved it. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I didn't think of this, but now that Peter says it, you know, Andrew, you could just become spoonacular, but right. for this specific type of recipe. Yeah, I think yeah. that's such a cool idea. I love that. A great idea. For thrown sure. around. Yeah. Um, I'll also say like, while working with Andrew on this project, um, Andrew was super fearless with asking, uh, questions and was like an information sponge. Uh, every time we'd work together, I'd feel like, wow, like he really took that idea, implemented it. And he's just like moved on. And I felt like every single time that we were able to meet, we made like tremendous progress. So, um, I want to commend you on, on being a, being a sponge of ideas, uh, cause I think that that really shows here in the app that you made. So well done. Thank you, Danny. I will throw it on over to our next presenter, Matthias. All right. We can see that, right? right. Um, my name is Matthias. I live in the suburbs of Chicago. And I really, really, really like video games. So I designed a web application for people like me who own too many of them, uh, whether they be a collector or maybe you're running a storefront, um, you know, just a place for you to organize your video games to a degree. Uh, this is the homepage here. We have options to create a new account or just log in. I'm going to log in as an existing user. And upon logging in, it takes us straight to our account page where it displays some basic user information. Uh, there's a drop down tab here where you can update your uh, email address, username, or your password. On the sidebar, there is an option to delete your account. Uh, we don't want to do that just yet, as well as links to um, lists that we might have made previously. Up here on the nav bar, we also have options to just go straight onto our list index page and the games search page. So we're going to go to the list index page and up here in the top right corner, we have an option to make a new list. Uh, something that I really wanted that, you know, the basic foundation for this was uh, honestly to make like a wish list. So we are going to make a wish list. It gets added to our list index page, and there is no image at this moment. The image for the list will be populated based on the first game in that list. So let's get some games for this list. We'll go over to the game search page, uh, and we're going to look for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Who doesn't love Turtles in Time? Uh, the information on this page is pulled from the IGDB uh, API. Uh, it's just populating with the box art of a game and the title. Some games on their API do not have images. 
So we had to put um, placeholders in there. But if we click on a game, it takes us straight to the show page. There's a lot of information on here, the platforms that it is on, um, genres, a summary. Uh, there's a rating. I did not make this rating, so do not get mad at me if a game is lower than you would like to see it. Uh, and then down here on the bottom, we actually have uh, links to similar games that you might enjoy. That also comes from the API. Um, here's kind of the meat and potatoes of the app. We have an option to add a game to one of our lists. So I'm going to put this onto my wish list. And then kind of for the collecting aspect or uh, storefront inventory type deal, we have the option to make quantities. Um, we're going to go ahead and get one more game for our list. Good old Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City. Everybody knows and loves this game. Make sure it's in there because I do not own a copy of this. So now we're going to navigate to our list index page. Our options are to edit the list itself or um, just view this specific list. So if we view the list, we have a couple options here. Um, from a collector and storefront um, perspective, I think having these quantity options is useful and it does go down to zero, but it won't go negative because you can't really have a negative thing. But if you are running a storefront, I could see you wanting to add you know, every game on a platform and then just as you get them increment the quantity to what you have. Um, and then, you know, once I buy Michael Jordan KS in the Windy City, I can just remove it from my list and he's out of here. Um, we also have the option to edit a wish list. If I'm a little more excited about this wish list, I can, you know, update the title or I can just delete this page altogether. And that'll bounce me back to my list index. Something else I was considering was if you were going to use this, if you wanted to send a list to somebody. So I believe if I go to index 26, this is a list made by a different account. Um, I do not have the options to fudge with the quantities or remove a game from this list, but I can in fact see what this person has on their list. And if they were you know, sending this to me as like a birthday list or something, and I was a little confused, I can click on a game and go to this page and know for a fact this is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Wii U and not the remade version for the Nintendo Switch. So I don't buy them the wrong game. <laughs> um, a couple of things that I wanted to implement into the website. I had a functioning thing on this games index page before where you could straight up add a game to a specific list from this page. But when I tried implementing it, once I made the cards layout, once I tried implementing it into there, it just, it was so cluttered. I, and my brain is not super design focused. So it couldn't think of a good way to get all of those buttons within these cards properly. Um, but that's something I definitely want to try and find a way to get that back in there. Um, I was also hoping to have more filters so that I could sort, you know, filter out anything that's not on a specific platform I'm looking for, or perhaps search by a genre. Um, because currently the only way to get a genre is if you're on the page, it just displays the information on there. Um, but that is the basis for my app it's just kind of a a way for you to stay organized so that you don't go to the store and buy your third copy of mario party 2 because you forgot that you owned that <laughs> or you know organizing uh thanks for listening and if you have any questions i'd love to hear them awesome thanks matthias and i'll throw it over to peter for some questioning yeah, this is a, this is a great app with some uh, deep cuts over there. I'm like Billy Hatcher. Okay, okay, we got we got some some hidden gems in there. Although I will say that uh, I do prefer the Genesis version of that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. That's a maybe possibly unpopular opinion. Just putting that out there. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about the API that you use. I'm not familiar with it. You said it's the IGDB API. Did you find it to be easy to use? Documentation. How was that experience? So the, the API, luckily for me, it was 
purchased by Twitch, which is owned by Amazon. Wow. So yeah, yeah. I had unlimited, essentially, API calls. There were very little limitations to what I could, you know, how often I could just try and run with something. So that wasn't a fear for me. Um, it did work in a way that I was unfamiliar with, though, when we were in class and learning the basics of, you know, making calls to an API, this one was using a lot of like body parameters and other strange things. So there, there's a lot of documentation, almost an overwhelming amount of it. So it, you know, it, I spent a lot of time trying to sift through that and make sure I was getting all the information I needed. Um, it, and it has all the information I need. It was just, it, I had to put in a, a decent amount of work into making sure I understood it. Yeah, yeah, it must have been very exciting when you start seeing this stuff populate on the page. Probably. Oh, you got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, cool. And then you had mentioned that you know this this app. I can see it having a lot of different potential audiences, right? Like as a game collector and possibly as a storefront. Um, one thing that crossed my mind is like using this maybe as like a trading platform. Like if you're a collector and there's games that you're missing from your collection, because you had mentioned like you built the functionality where you can see other people's collections, right? And you basically built the functionality where you can have a wish list. So you'd be able to like, you know, with a couple of tweaks to the interface, give this a, the possibility for somebody who's just looking to complete their collection to be able to like trade with other people. Is that something that you considered or is that something you'd want to do for version two? Yes, if actually, if you had a link to my Trello board in my original proposal for the application, there was a uh, marketplace slash uh, swap meet type area that, and it unfortunately got pushed into the um, the ice box. But you know, I'm I'm all for I'm so passionate about video games and and collecting them that I'm I'm odds are I'm going to find a way to get that working in here, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just noticing all the building blocks are right there, right? Like everything is there. People can see the things, all the different pieces. So that that seems like to me a, a really great application of like where you're just one step away from 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 having that that like really niche kind of uh, website that that provides that specific service, which is really cool. Yeah. No, this is a really sharp app. Uh, I love it. So congrats, uh, congrats on the app. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um, yes, when Matthias pitched to me that he wanted to make a video game app, I was, of course, on board as a fellow enthusiast. Um, but we did have some arguments over console, PC, you know, that was in there. Um, but it turned out uh, working super well, looking really beautiful. And exactly just like Peter said, you're one step away from being able to do all those initial ideas that you pitched um, now that you've got the, the basics in there. So awesome job. And I'm going to throw it over to our, uh, our last presenter for group one. We're going to actually take a break in between our presentations and then group two will come in. Um, so my last presenter for group one is going to be Vinny. So Vinny, take it away for us. Hello. Let me just get this set up. Okay. You can see my screen, right? Cool. Okay, so my application is a job organizer and analysis application. And uh, it was sort of uh, meant to solve the problem that we're all gonna be facing real soon here. And that is organizing all of our applications. And since the coding industry is known for having to apply a lot to get a job, um, I'm hoping this actually helps me in my job search, so. Um, interface is standard on here. It's worth noting um, for user signup, I do have an address. And while this isn't uh, oriented for user interactivity, like user user interactivity, um, I do have a geocoder on the back end that will compare the user's address with the address of the companies they're applying to. So I'll get into the main app here. So I've used Excel before. I'm sure a lot of people have used Excel before to manage a job search. And it kind of becomes a nightmare after a while because it's just little tiny line after little tiny line after little tiny line of stuff. And I mean, in Excel, you can sort, uh, you can you know sort by distance and everything like that, but it just doesn't feel as quick or simple. And it's harder to do more advanced stuff. So. If you want to, okay, say um, 
find out who you haven't sent a follow up to and maybe who is just currently pending like you just haven't had any interaction with them you haven't sent any follow ups well you can find out who you haven't sent any follow ups to and actually go ahead and start um, pinging them with follow ups so you get more engagement um, on your end. And maybe distance is important to you because maybe you've got an electric car and it's got a range of like 100 miles. Um, these would be out of the question if you want to get there in one charge. And let's say you want to keep it like low range as well. Like I know um, remote work is a big thing right now, but maybe that's important to you that you don't fly at all too. So. Um, calculating the distance for me at least is important so it's there but it's just something you can uh, do with that and one of the things um, like let's say you decide okay I want to move somewhere like let's say I want to be in Chicago you can just edit your information and be like okay I'm moving to Chicago Illinois to work because they've got they seem to have more of the jobs you're looking for you can go back to that and it's you're going to get everything close to you on that so you can change that you can edit your applications like maybe i did send a follow-up here to microsoft i can update that so like that functionality is there like anything you're going to get in excel or like even uh career score is going to be there but career score was another uh issue this is attempting to solve because they use a card system and again if you've got like this is only 14 applications right now if you've got like hundreds of them or like just a large amount in general the cards are going to be a nightmare to organize like if you like let's say i talked to pickle rick here like i can't really find that like on the fly with either Excel or uh, career score or a site like that. And uh, the main reason I made this is actually over an analysis. So I use D3JS. Um, in this analysis view, I calculated the size based on the enthusiasm because I kind of want to take, uh, I guess a little of the tension out of the job search. Like I want to be like, okay, what am I enthusiastic about? Where am I applying? And what am I getting responses from based on, uh, sorry, I kind of lost train of thought, but like, what am I most enthusiastic about? And am I getting the responses I'm expecting about company, expecting from companies I'm enthusiastic about? Like maybe, my confidence is low, my enthusiasm is high, but I'm sort of seeing a reverse thing. And this is just a prototype, but I'm hoping to like actually alter these bubbles based on a combination of your enthusiasm, your confidence, and maybe the company's engagement with you. Like maybe you're not getting the engagement you expect, or maybe you're just not engaging enough yourself. So maybe, um, and it's a lot of maybes, like there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's from a coding perspective, it's a lot of filters that need to happen because it's like, if this, then that, if this, then that, well, what if this and that are a factor? And that's what I'm sort of hoping to do with the analysis end. And um, if I do it the way I want to, I want this to look like a stock ticker wall. Like I don't want to, because otherwise I'll overanalyze a job app, uh, job search. Like, I want to just look at it and be like, okay, I'm not engaging here. I'll just engage there a little more. Okay, I'm not getting a lot of responses here. Um, maybe I need to put in a little more effort there and sort of just take that edge off of the job search and maybe even gamify it a little bit. And I think that's about it. You can update your profile applications here, edit your applications. And yeah, some things I, I know I do want to add uh, sorting by time. So like do a distance divided by 60 and have it assigned to a slider so I can see like how 
long it'll take to get somewhere. So if I want to work somewhere that's two hours away, I can filter by that as well. And I definitely want to shrink these and maybe have tool tips that show the full info. But so far, this is uh, what I've got. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you, Vinny. And I'm going to throw it on over to Peter to ask a few questions. Yeah, really, really impressive app, Vinny. Um, I actually, the first thing I noticed was uh, this particular page is a really sharp front end. Uh, and it's for those, all of us who've been working with this, we know it's really difficult to make a front end that has a lot of data look good. If there's a big ass, big splash image, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, you can make that look good, but organizing your information, you did a really nice job here. I'm curious what that was like, uh, like the, the, the little filters drop down and like having those little edit links. I feel like you did a lot of custom UI work. Uh, was, that, was that a challenge? Was that something you enjoyed? What was that process like? Um, it was interesting, I think the, most difficult part was actually the methods because this is actually uh, updated in real time. So if I went to actually add an application, I'll just say, I'm just gonna do this really fast here. Um, but if I had an application and I had just some crazy method, like this is, I don't have choices for users. And uh, like I had to have that so it would actually add yes, yeah. user input. And something I could do is actually have this do suggestions based on past um, input be up here, but that was probably one of the most difficult things because if you actually duplicate this, like if a user spells it wrong, that's something I would like to add to. Um, it will actually have two glass doors if they use a lowercase sure. g. So I need to do like, just like a down case and then maybe a capitalize on them just for display purposes but yeah yeah no but like i'm saying it's a it's a lot of work to have that really nice custom ui there and that's one of the reasons why you know building your own app uh gives you the ability to sort of really customize it to your specific needs um yeah going back to that actually that three d3 visualization i'm curious um you know, what it was like uh, to work with D3 and also if you have plans, because you had mentioned like there's a lot of different filters in terms of like, I know you said you wanted different types of visualizations, but even with this visualization here, what's going to dictate the size of each of those bubbles? And there's a lot of different possibilities there, right? Engagement, enthusiasm, yeah. all those things. So do you have plans on making that interactive where the users can click on things and see it like sort of reshape and grow? Um, what are some of your further plans working with, with uh, these, these visualizations? Um, yeah, actually, that was one of the reasons I used D3 as well, because Chart.js has more static charts. And sure. I know D3, um, as the job search goes on, this data is actually going to compress horizontally. And it may become, uh, it may get to the point where there's just too much data. So I know D3, like it actually has a warp filter, where as you move the mouse, it'll sort of zoom in on a range and sort of squish everything else off to the side. So something like that could be uh, really helpful. And then I definitely intend to add like different tabs for views. Like maybe I just, if a user doesn't care which method they used to apply, maybe just compress them all into a single row and just yeah. display it as a single row. And then maybe be able to switch, have buttons to switch on the fly between different values for the size. Like maybe have the size be how many interviews you got, or maybe just double the size if you get one interview, just yeah. so you know that you're getting more interaction and engagement somewhere that you just yeah. aren't getting somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's awesome that you have this in here because you've just sort of opened up a world of possibilities in terms of visualizations. And so if this is the foundation, then every time you have a new idea, you can just add more and more stuff and make it more and more interactive. So that's very, very cool. Yeah, awesome job, great app. All right. Thank you so much, Vinny. Yeah. And uh, working with uh, with Vinny and getting Vinny to, to sort of take, Vinny was very much the type of person who would listen to an idea and analyze it very closely, very intentionally. And then he'd be like, yes, I'm going to make a decision to do that because that makes sense now that I've thought very thoroughly about it. Um, <laughs> very like logical processor. Um, it was really fun to see this app like come alive uh, via all of that. Um, culminating into this. And then, yeah, the visualization, super difficult to work with. So proud of Vinny for getting that in and making all that work. That was all him. I did nothing. Uh, he worked on that visualization. He got all that working on his own. So amazing job. 
Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and take over with my screen share here for just a moment. Um, and what we're going to do is we are about to take a brief intermission between our presenters. Um, I do have 15 students presenting today, first seven have gone. So we're gonna save that second uh, half of the group for after a brief intermission. So we're gonna take a break. Um, so we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Um, we're gonna start at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, 1 p.m. Central Time, and we are going to resume with some more presentations. So we'll take a break off YouTube. We'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. <laughs> 